Shalom, hello again. Welcome to our new series, The Sons of Israel. We're coming to you from location in the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, those plus many important others we'll be teaching on in our series. These are the big personalities in the Bible, from the patriarchs down through the Messiah to Paul and so forth, the most influential people that ever lived, the sons of Israel. On this program, we'll take you back to the source of the star of Jewish history, the father of nations, Abraham. The Lord your God has chosen you as his treasured possession because he loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers. You are a chosen generation to proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. He was a Gentile. Abraham, he came from Ur, uh, over by Iraq. He, uh, and yet he's, <laughs> by all means, the brightest light in Jewish history until the coming of Messiah himself. His story is told in the book of Genesis, of course. Three quarters of that book is the story of the patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and especially Joseph, uh, who gets more space in the book than any other patriarch. Genesis, of course, supplies us with the beginning. That's how we know how the world was made. That's how we uh, meet Adam. Uh, that's how we learn of the flood and then of the Tower of Babel, and it's significant because, I mean, here God has already had a flood and destroyed all these uh, pagan uh, people, and then uh, the descendants of Noah, somehow they are at work building some kind of a tower to reach unto heaven, they say. Well, they apparently were astrologers. They wanted to study the stars. Heaven is uh, very, very impressive, no question, and, uh, uh, but it, it's the sin of worshiping the creation instead of the Creator. God made the stars, but He wants to worship. They were so fascinated with the stars they were forgetting about Him, I assume from His attitude, and so He confounded their languages and, and took them away. And, and at the end of that very chapter, Genesis 11, we read of a new start, that is Terah and the birth of Abraham. So it appears He then chose a single people to work through, kind of giving up on the the large number of, uh, of men. And uh, so he, ch he chose a people and they were survivors, at least. The patriarchs and their progeny, the Jews survive uh, with hostile neighbors, with intra-family struggles, with uh, long wanderings. <laughs> Look what they have today, a war in the land. And, and uh, it was always thus. It's, you know, we, we make a big deal. CNN thinks they've discovered a new war. This war has been going on for 4,000 years. They just rode up lately with cameras, but uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, Israel has always been a struggle, and it's interesting in that respect. Uh, Jacob, you know, uh, when his name was changed to Israel, a, a striver with God, a, a fighter, a, a, a survivor. Well, the Bible is the history of Israel. Uh, that's all there is to that. It's the story of uh, Israel. If it's not taught that way in your church or your seminary, change churches, change seminaries. It's not the Bible if it's not taught as the story of Israel. It's the acts of God working with the people of Israel. Even the uh, Greek epistles sent to the empire are written by Jewish apostles from Israel, and uh, they are the lessons in how to serve the Jewish Messiah. Now, the Old Testament, of course, is the dealings of God and man. 
very much more so than the new, which is uh, instructions to go into the kingdom for believers. Uh, the Old Testament has life stories. It has the, the emotions, the, the, the stumblings, the failures, the repentance, the salvation, uh, the history, past and future. It's just funny to say the, the history of the future, but the story continues right past our time on into the kingdom. Gosh, uh, since there's a thousand-year kingdom coming up, uh, we're getting there, but uh, we've uh, maybe lived six-sevenths of the time allotted, but then there's eternity after that, which the Bible also covers. But know this, before Abraham, there were no dates. That is, if you read the Scripture, you don't find the uh, uh, reigns of kings or, or the building of uh, pyramids or something with which you can date the, the events back then. We don't know when the flood was, really. Don't know exactly when the Tower of Babel was, other than it led to uh, Terah, Abraham's father, at the end of the chapter. But with Abraham, we have the first historical date. We can put him about 2,000 years before Christ. Because in his story, we get details of place and customs and, and events that happen. You can even look in a secular history books and, and place more or less by knowing that uh, such and such uh, uh, nations were established in the Mesopotamian Valley or whatever a against where Abraham was. As a matter of fact, archaeologists have dug up five cities that are mentioned and so on. Uh, so we can accurately place him in time, and from there on we can place all of the Bible characters in time. God told him, leave your land, get up and go. It's a tough order, really, when you think about it. And leave your past. I mean, leave your, the life you were living and become a nomad. I mean, Abraham was living in a civilized city. Ur was a, a place where there was a university, there was, there was a study, there was a written language, uh, uh, things going on that he was involved with. But uh, God just told him real plainly, uh, Genesis 12, 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Uh, he was uh, uh, like us in a way. You know, uh, the New Testament tells us much the same thing. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Paul writes, But this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Well, uh, this is the same for us then as it was for him way back then. He was an open, willing, obedient, faithful servant. He was the friend of God. Uh, he received enormous blessings. Uh, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Oh, my gosh, what an honor. Uh, he brought his son to be sacrificed. He was so obedient to God. His only son here, <laughs> Mount Moriah, where the golden dome is behind me. That's Mount Moriah. Abraham came from the opposite horizon, from uh, Beersheba and walked to that mountain and offered his son in sacrifice. I'm sure you know the story. Uh, the journey, though, through the Promised Land, he came to Haran. Uh, Terah, his father, died there. Some of the family remained there. His wife, Sarai, was barren, but God was in control. And we have the story of Hagar, his, uh, as they did in those days. He, he took the wife's maid to have a child, but God uh, well, promised him that he was going to have a child of his own. He just was a skeptic. Uh, Genesis 15, 2 to 4 says, What wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thine heir, God answers. Abraham was skeptical, but he obeyed the God in circumcision. It was instituted, and uh, it was unique in his day, a sign no man could overlook. Uh, Genesis 17, uh, 9 and 10 says this, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And so the Jews to this day still practice circumcision. 
When we return, we'll look at the character and faith of this father of nations. Ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, and our catalog with videos, books, and music. Our correspondence course, the Institute of Jewish Christian Studies, includes reading packets, teaching cassettes, and mail-in tests. Did you know that Zola takes tours to Israel, Greece, and the Holy Land Experience theme park in Orlando, Florida? Please contact us for more information. You know, Abraham was a lot uh, more things than just a uh, patriarch, you might say. He was a soldier. He was a bargainer. He was a sacrificer. He was a landowner. Uh, just to give examples, as a soldier, you know, he battled kings in Genesis 14 uh, for his nephew Lot. It says there, uh, verses 14 and 15, when Abraham heard his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan, that's way up north, the Golan Heights. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus, all the way off into Syria in this battle. And he won. With Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham managed to spare his nephew Lot when he <laughs> bargained with God over the people there when God was going to destroy the place. Uh, he said, if there's 50 good men, if there's 40, if there's 30 inches gone down. And in the end of Genesis uh, 18, 31, 33, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure, ten shall be found there. And God said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. Uh, ten is an interesting number. It's a Jewish minion. It's the quorum for prayer in the synagogue. But anyhow, God knew how many he had and how many not, and uh, Sodom and Gabor, of course, were destroyed. Uh, he was a sacrificer. God said, Take thou thy son whom thou lovest. Uh, Genesis 22, 1. That's the first time love is mentioned in the Bible. Genesis 22, and it's connected to sacrifice. Uh, God told him, Go to Moriah, the place where uh, Abraham and Isaac approached, and uh, and Abraham was tested. The chosen people have always been tested. They're going through tests today. Again, we think we, we just discovered something new here. This test has been going on for the Palestinians simply been replaced by uh, the Turks before them and the Marmelukes and then the Crusaders and the Muslims before that and the Romans before that and the Greeks and the Babylonians and, and the Persians. And how far back should I go? The Egyptians, uh, the Philistines, my gosh. Uh, all this time they have had enemies in order to hold this land, but they are the rightful owners of it because of this covenant with Abraham. Now, as a landowner, he bought a burial place for his wife. Uh, in Genesis 23, it tells how he paid 400 shekels for uh, a tomb for Sarah when she died, and that's why we've come here to these tombs. They're very ancient-looking tombs, and he bought something like this to, to lay away his wife, but he paid 400 shekels. If we compare, uh, Jeremiah paid just 17 shekels for a field. Uh, the Midianites paid 20 shekels for Joseph and took him as a slave when his brothers sold him. The threshing floor on which Mount Moriah, <laughs> on which the temple was built, Arunah's threshing floor, uh, he charged David uh, 50 shekels for that. But in buying a burial place for Sarah, Abraham did an important thing. He confirmed that he believed the covenant that God gave to him. He was committed to God's promise that he would occupy and his children would occupy this land. You don't bury your wife just any place. You bury her where you can go and mourn. It's, it's reminiscent of Tel Aviv uh, in a sense. They, uh, the Jews had to uh, establish a burial site there. The Muslims did not allow the Jews to bury their dead in Jaffa during an outbreak of cholera. Jaffa was an Arab... Uh, a settlement uh, along the Mediterranean coast just south of what is now Tel Aviv. And uh, if the Jews died, they wouldn't allow them to be put in the ground, similar to Saudi Arabia during the Persian Gulf War. And we came to defend them, and they said, well, what if a Jewish American soldier dies? You're not going to bury him here, are you? <laughs> Imagine. Uh, but uh, they wouldn't allow them to bury, so they went way north of the city and established a burial site. 
You go where you can mourn your dead. And that was the beginning of the great city, the largest city in Israel, Tel Aviv. The place Abraham purchased is at Machpelah, which is next to Mamre. It's still there. Uh, the, there is a, a, a mosque or, or whatever, a building with burial plots there uh, that Muslims worship. And, you know, the ancient Philistines respected Abraham's purchase. Even when the Jews came back from Egypt, they realized they had bought the land. Uh, but the modern Palestinians uh, fight over it with the Jews. They claim to be uh, descended from the uh, Philistines, but they don't have their understanding. Uh, the Zionist Congress quote talks about Jewish ownership of land here. At the first Zionist Congress in 1897, Professor Herman Shapira, a noted mathematician, drew up the plans for the Jewish National Fund that would oversee the use of funds contributed by Jews worldwide for the purchase of land in Palestine. The land was redeemed acre by acre. Unlike the colonizers of, for example, Australia, South Africa, and North America, who came to a land not theirs and took it by conquest, Jews returned to their own homeland, from which they were forcibly expelled, and they redeemed it by purchase, most often at inflated prices. Uh, some of the kibbutzes uh, paid money for land like sand dunes and, and malaria-infested swamps at a price as higher than the best farmland in Iowa. So Abraham had real property, uh, not like stock certificates or uh, bank accounts, but property on the ground, not movable. Uh, and Abraham becomes finally the father of all who believe. You know, uh, one-third of Hebrews 11, the great chapter on faith that talks about all the champions of faith, one-third of that chapter is about Abraham. He had so many promises. He's a sample believer. I mean, first off, a lost sinner. Ephesians 2.12 says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's how Abraham was when he was in Ur, uh, simply a Gentile unbeliever. But God appeared to Abraham like he appears to us. He called Abraham to separate himself and wait on promises as we do. Uh, Hebrews 11, 13, uh, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Uh, Christians have waited for the Lord's coming all these years. He hasn't come. Uh, they're still waiting. They, too, live by promises. Abraham was a great type of Christ. He, he left his father's house. Uh, he blesses all the earth. He is certainly a kinsman redeemer. Uh, he has headship of the nations, as does Christ. Uh, Jesus is identified in the first verse of the New Testament in Matthew 1.1 1, 1, with Abraham. Uh, the first verse says, Has Sefer Yeshua HaMashiach ben David ben Avraham. Uh, uh, the book of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, God's choice uh, in the chosen people, uh, the, the blessings and so on, becomes evident as history unfolds. He really did uh, redeem these promises to Abraham over the years. Fourteen million Jews today have a huge impact on the world. I mean, look, this is uh, uh, the, the second most uh, important computer center in the world. My goodness, Israel, five million people is less than live in Chicago. Uh, ahead of Japan, ahead of China, ahead of all of Western Europe uh, in, in this important area. 20% uh, of the Nobel Prizes have been won by Jews. They're less than one-fourth of one percent of the people. Indeed, the Scripture says it to Deuteronomy 4, 6, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes, that is the Jewish law, and they'll say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Let's face it, the Old Testament is the heart of Western civilization. It's not, as you were taught in courses called Western civilization, Greece or Rome. I mean, my gosh, before the first Greek walked on earth, a thousand years before the writers of the Old Testament uh, gave proper uh, rates for interest and for usury and, and laws of, of cleanliness and so on, uh, without which uh, uh, millions perished in plagues in Europe. Uh, it's the Old Testament that's the basis of our government, our fairness, our morality. Uh, you know, Pope John Paul had a wonderful quote, This extraordinary people, Israel, continues to bear signs of its divine election. 
I said this to an Israeli politician once, and he readily agreed, but was quick to add, if only it could cost less. Israel has truly paid a high price for its election. I'm afraid that's true. There's a negative side to being the chosen people. <laughs> it just means you have a destiny with God. You're chosen for blessings. Uh, it means that God's enemy chooses you too. Everything that God does, the devil copies, and here we are, uh, the Jews surviving, but like Job, going on and on in this big game between God and the devil. Well, there's a coincidence to think about, uh, an easy way to remember when Abraham was. Israel was born in modern times in 1948 A.D. Some uh, uh, expositors of the Old Testament put the birth of Abraham in 1948 B.C. Isn't that interesting? Genesis 12.3 still holds true today in today's world. I will bless them that bless Israel, and I will curse him that curses him. Abraham, of course, is a logical figure from where to start our uh, shows about the sons of Israel. We're going to go down through uh, the heroes of the land. There are many of them, of course. Israel has such a long and rich history. You know, it's a shame that in places like Russia, for example, they just don't know the history of Israel. The, the Jewish people don't have a chance to study it. And the Israelis set up programs like the one we're going to look at now. Our organization, its name is Machanaim, uh, started in Russia about 20 odd years ago. And we were uh, an underground organization strictly forbidden uh, during the communist regime in Russia. We started as a rather small group interested in learning something about our tradition, history, uh, language, so uh, we proceeded uh, by learning each other and teaching some beginners. So I guess there are those who have never seen the Bible till they arrive here. You are very, very right. My personal uh, experience, uh, I was about 25 years old when uh, for the first time I've heard one story from the Bible in English and the Voice of America uh, from one Catholic preach. Uh, where he told about the Jacob and Esau story. And I thought, what, a, what an interesting story. It would be good to know more about that book. Uh, the book was forbidden uh, in the Bolsheviks' time. So there are highly ignorant about the Bible and our tradition. Well, you must feel personally rewarded when you see the spiritual growth in these immigrants. Sure, because uh, I decided that I have to know at least something about our tradition, culture, history. And since then, I'm trying to share my modest knowledge with others. So when we see at least a small success. We feel proud and happy. What do you think of those Christian organizations who are making efforts to bring immigrants here? What is important is their understanding that bringing Jews home to this holy land is the task of all the humankind, that it was promised in the Bible by, by our prophets that uh, gathering Jews here on this land will bring happiness to all the mankind. So do you think that you're part of prophecy being fulfilled? Uh, I'm sure that uh, the prophecies uh, that are written in the Bible are very, very true. And I do hope that we'll see the realization of that is written there in the very soon future with God's help. Such a time of wandering as no people here before Yet you kept together your people sure to a distant shore Always as of yore Yours forevermore
Well, freedom of worship, that's a real blessing in this world, you know. You sure wouldn't have it in Saudi Arabia or Iraq or Iran or Syria or any place that uh, uh, is a dictatorship, not in Cuba, not in Red China, and not certainly in Russia as we saw. The Jews couldn't study their own history. Here in America, we all have to be competent in American history uh, to graduate high school. At least you did when I graduated high school. And uh, we could study the Bible. We could study the history of the chosen people and of the Messiah. Uh, we can study the history of Red China, for that matter, if that's what you want to do. And uh, you're free to think and study as you like, to know anybody's story. And uh, that's not a small matter at all in this world. It's a blessing. And next week's program is called The Blessing, and this one is going to be about Isaac and Jacob. So tune in next week for The Blessing and Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our offer this week, Zola's Notebook, The Bible, The Whole Story. Seven vital doctrines are examined. The Abrahamic Covenant, the Law, Prophecy, the Messiah, Grace, the Church, and the Kingdom all presented in a very readable and clear style. The notebook also contains pockets for notes and our monthly newsletters. Each month, our free Levitt letter brings you updates on recent events in Israel with insightful articles to help you understand how these events fit into biblical prophecy. We cover the government, the seminaries, and the Lord in these times. The Levitt letter also contains Hebrew lessons with Hebraic insight, special offers, and in-depth columns written by some of America's finest journalists. Please call 1-800-WONDERS. That's 1-800-966-3377. Or write to Zola, Box 12268, Dallas, Texas 75225. When you're on the Internet, visit Zola's website, www.levitt.com. Zola Levitt Presents depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.